Um, I am Mara Benadusi, Professor of Anthropology at the University of Catania and uh, also current uh, president of the Italian Society for Applied Anthropology. Welcome to all of you to this first Speaker's Corner appointment, Listen to the Pandemic, organized by our association in cooperation with the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of Catania. Before we start, just a brief explanation. Uh, the idea behind these meetings is to open a digital space for listening, uh, speaking up and sharing reflections on in times of lockdown. <laughs> In times that force all of us staying at home to, to use our knowledge, our anthropological common sense, and even our ethnographic imagination to reflect on the current pandemic and, and to make sense of this exceptional experience started just a few months ago in much of the world. As members of the Italian Society for Applied Anthropology, we thought why do not bring together anthropologists coming from different countries that wish to make their researches beneficial for society at large, and why don't ask them to recount about their studies on similar situations of epidemic and pandemic in the world? Why do not try together to contribute to a better understanding of, of the contradictory pressures to which the current situation exposes all, all of us? And most of all, why, why do not listen to these uh, uncertain times to, to envision how the world could look like after the pandemic and where we are going after this health crisis? In it is, classical version at Hyde Park in London, the speaker's corner uh, started as a, an area of open air uh, discussion about topics of public interest. Our, uh, our way of re re revisiting this tradition includes um, mostly two dimensions. Uh, on one end, we want to focus on uh, fundamental rights, the right of life, health, and work, education. And on the other end, we, we intend to promote debates which pay attention to, to different and, and even uh, uh, opposite points of view and to, to the circulation of ideas and the expression of uh, our reasoned opinions. Uh, we believe indeed that the anthropology can help humanity to cultivate a, a positive readiness to both listening the others and question ourselves. And it is precisely with this intent that we had decided to open this speaker's corner online. So thanks, thanks to everybody to be here. And thanks very much to Frederick Keck, who accepted to be our first uh, uh, speaker today. I'm really delighted to introduce to you Frederick, who is quite a, a remarkable uh, scholar, and he was trained both in, in France and in the United States where he studied anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Frederic has a good track record of publications on the history of French anthropology and its relation with philosophy. And uh, he also headed the research and teaching department of the Museum du Quai in Paris between 2014 and 2018. And he is currently research director and uh, head of the uh, Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Sociale at the CNRS in Paris. He studies biosecurity standards and bi how, how biosecurity standards apply to humans and animals, and also the techniques of preparedness and forecasting that these standards produce in ecological disasters and health crises. His works uh, can best be described as the confluence of the history uh, of science, uh, sociology of risk, and probably uh, the anthropology of nature. And uh, Frederick deals also with scientific networks and the ecological conservation in museums, zoos, and natural reserve. Uh, Frederick is the author of two books, uh, uh, and uh, these books are, uh, the last two books are on epidemics and biosecurity, uh, avian reservoirs, virus hunters, and bird watchers in Chinese Sentinel Post, in English, and the Sentinel de Pandemie in France. Uh, I would highlight also how Frederic uh, has got recently involved uh, as principal investigator in a comparative study funded by AXA on the social factors that influence uh, the transmission of diseases from animals to humans. And I hope you will uh, recount a bit more about this new project uh, during the presentation and the speech. And uh, that's it, all right. I, I don't want to take too much time. And so I'm going to leave the floor here to Frederic. 
the title of, of his talk is What do bats think of the virus, sentinel and pandemic? And Frederic, our speaker's corner is, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara, uh, for organizing this uh, seminar. Uh, it's an honor to open your speaker's corner with this conference on the, um, the COVID pandemic seen from uh, China, since um, uh, I will take the opportunity uh, to think about the pandemic uh, through the research I have done in South China in the last um, 10 years. Um, and so I, I, I will uh, open the PowerPoint. Um, yes, so. Ah. Can you see it? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. So I should share the screen first. Okay. It's so I will talk, okay. I will talk for about 45 minutes and then um, I'm happy to take questions. This is a PowerPoint presentation that I built. Uh, at the end of January 2020 for a presentation of the book uh, that just came out uh, at the beginning of January uh, at Duke University Press, uh, Avian Reservoirs, Virus Hunters and Bird Watchers in Chinese Sentinel Post. Uh, it's a talk I gave at the Anthropology Department of uh, UCLA. And um, I, I took the opportunity to uh, present my book through the beginning of the coronavirus crisis, which at the time was only a Chinese crisis, and nobody could expect that it would arrive in Europe and, and the United States. So I, I built this PowerPoint to give a few information about the beginning of the crisis in China and, and, and present some of the main concepts of the book to test if they worked to think about the beginning of this pandemic. Now, as this pandemic unfolds, some of the hypotheses that I presented are still valid and maybe some others should be changed, but that is up to you to see what has changed since the end of January. But so far, I, I felt that the, 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 the coronavirus crisis has followed the same patterns as the health crisis I have studied in South China, since we can consider that, that the coronavirus is an extension to the world of the SARS crisis that affected Hong Kong in 2003. And what we can debate is the similarities and differences between SARS and coronavirus. But of course, my, my, my main research is not about bats and COVID and the coronavirus. It's about birds and flu viruses. But what I will try to show is how avian flu viruses have been a model to, to anticipate uh, respiratory diseases coming from China, such as COVID-19. So I will start with the emergence of this new virus in December 2019 in Wuhan, the alert of um, public health officers uh, about a new respiratory uh, disease, a cluster of uh, a typical pneumonia around the wet market or the animal market in Wuhan. And very quickly, um, physicians and virologists realized that this new virus was very similar to SARS uh, and that it was probably coming from bats because the similarities between the genetic sequence of this new virus and, and the coronavirus, so, sorry, between this new virus and the coronavirus uh, that had been uh, found on bats in 2018 were uh, uh, showed. At the time of January, uh, of the end of January 2020, there was the hypothesis that it was transmitted by a snake, 
which was very implausible because no zoonotic virus or these viruses that shift from animals to human has so far been found on snakes. But of course, since all this debate is related to our imaginary on Chinese animal markets, this hypothesis was very convenient. Now, the, the other hypothesis that has since been proposed is uh, uh, pangolins, uh, because pangolins from Malaysia have been found with this new coronavirus. Very difficult to, to prove because uh, we, cannot, we cannot say, we cannot find uh, the, the human patient would have been in contact with a pangolin uh, that in, a, in a way that would be similar to the, 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 the palm civets that were found in 2003 as the intermediary vehicle for the transmission of the SARS coronavirus. So we know from the SARS coronavirus how it was transmitted from bats to civets to butchers in animal markets in the south of China, and then to physicians, and then to the rest of the world. So this animal part is still unknown, but it is sure that it comes from a bat. Uh, whether it was through an animal market or through a release from a lab is still uncertain. A release from a lab is very implausible, but cannot be excluded. But, so this is the chain of emergence and transmission. Now, it is called a coronavirus because, as you know, uh, this virus is, uh, uh, has a corona, a crown, uh, and it, it is because it's one of the biggest viruses that we know. Uh, a flu virus is, is much smaller than a coronavirus. And this explains that this virus is quite stable. Its behavior has been quite stable since January. Uh, so it's about 20% of the people who are affected by this virus have symptoms and about one, two percent die. And this virus uh, uh, is uh, uh, spreading and replicating in the health respiratory tract. And it has this spike protein that uh, uh, cling on the respiratory tract and then trigger an immunity, immunity response, inflammatory response of the immune system that can cause death. So after the emergence of this virus, there were massive measures of control in Wuhan and in the province of Hubei, decided by the Beijing government after three weeks lost in the transmission of the information of the, of the alarm. But then after uh, the 21st of January, 2020, uh, measures were very strong. And these measures have been assessed by WHO at the end of February as, 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 as working, as efficacious. And that's why the rest of the world is basically applying measures that have worked in Wuhan and in the Hubei province. And that's also one of the points we can discuss. Uh, I must mention also, since Mara mentioned that, that um, I'm actually working, I'm actually starting a new research project on uh, animal markets in central China uh, what is called wet markets, and we can come back to this expression. Uh, and I'm working with uh, a, a postdoc researcher, uh, Arnaud Morvan, who has worked with me on this AXA research project on the perception of uh, zoonosis coming from bats in Australia. Uh, so he, since he is a specialist of Australia, he has uh, uh, interviewed all the actors involved in biosecurity response to uh, the Hendra virus in Australia, not only vets uh, and uh, bat carers, uh, since the Hendra virus came from bats, but also Aboriginal people who have images and perception of bats. And what we're going to do is ask uh, um, uh, people in central China, and, and particularly civil servants, uh, what kind of animals uh, are circulate in these markets, so bats, but also pangolins, but also all kinds of animals, uh, and, and how it's going to be regulated after the COVID pandemic. So, the reason why China acted so strongly on the coronavirus, despite its quite low lethality, was that it reminded them, it reminded the Chinese authorities of the SARS virus. So just to 
Well, you've, all, you've all heard about this story, of course, through the media, but just to remind you very briefly, SARS emerged in Guangzhou at the end of 2002 and was detected in Hong Kong uh, in um, uh, February 2003 when a physician uh, who had treated patients in Guangzhou infected 10 people in a hotel in Hong Kong and these 10 people took flights to uh, Bangkok, Taipei, Beijing, um, uh, Singapore, and Toronto. And, and so from one cluster in Guangzhou, in a few days, there were clusters all over Asia and in Canada. And that's why it was considered as one of the first pandemics of the, 20th, of the 21st century. It was also considered as, a, as a, an Asia's 9-11, uh, because even if the number of casualties was quite low, so there were 8,000 people infected and 800 died. So for an emerging virus, it's quite, it's quite high, 10% people infected who died. But because the symptoms were declared very quickly after the infection, it was quite easy to uh, 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 control the epidemic. And so uh, the reason why SARS created an alarm was that China hid the cases for a few months. But when China started to control the epidemic, then uh, 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 the SARS coronavirus went down and returned to its animal reservoir, since we know that it came from bats. But when you enter uh, hospitals in, in China, you see these images of, of uh, nurses and uh, hospital staff who took care of uh, uh, SARS patients. And the idea for, Chinese, um, uh, uh, for the Chinese public opinion is that nurses uh, who died uh, treating patients with uh, SARS were very similar to the fire workers in New York who died uh, to, in helping uh, the, the people who fled uh, the World Trade Center. So it's very similar in terms of a small virus affecting patients, taking a plane and then spreading to the world and causing a disaster. But the, the most important disaster is that for a few months, the whole economy of China and Hong Kong and Singapore and Taiwan was blocked because the epidemic uh, constrained the authorities to stop the economy. And so there was this question since 2003, what if a new virus emerged blocking the economy in the area of the world where the most intense economic production is uh, uh, in course? Um, on this figure, you, on this slide, you can also so see um, one of the SARS he heroes. I will show you other SARS heroes in Hong Kong. But this is the Chinese SARS hero, uh, Zhong Nanshan. He was the director of the Guangzhou Institute of Respiratory Diseases. And at the time when uh, um, uh, the Minister of Health in Beijing was saying, oh, this is just a bacteria, uh, uh, this is a chlamydia, we know this disease, uh, uh, Zhong Nanshan said, no, it's a new virus. Uh, and he sent uh, samples from patients to Hong Kong uh, where they identified that it was a new coronavirus, that it was a coronavirus coming, uh, uh, coming from bats. And so this Zhong Nanshan uh, is, is one of the whistleblowers uh, in China and that's the reason why he's one of the authors of the uh, WHO report of uh, February 28, uh, as well as other experts from Hong Kong. Uh, but uh, he has been very strong in uh, advertising the Chinese government uh, in the management of the, uh, uh, of the COVID crisis. And I think he's one of the guys who told Beijing that the COVID, the, the new coronavirus was take, was, was, should be taken very seriously. And he, he's probably one of the guys who recommended uh, the lockdown of the area of Hubei. Now, um, if, you, if, you, if you go back to the history of Wuhan, uh, Wuhan is a city of 11 million people in the center of China uh, on, the, on the Jiangxi River and uh, it was uh, built uh, uh, in the 19th century when uh, uh, European uh, uh, traders uh, uh, settled uh, uh, trade posts on the Jiangxi River uh, and so uh, 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 there were three cities that were merged into one city in, uh, in the 1920s uh, but it's, it, it should also be remembered that uh, Wuhan was the site of uh, outbreak of the Chinese Revolution in 1911, when uh, military officers 
revolted against the Chinese, the Qing Empire, uh, because the, the because the 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 the, the, for, the Western banks uh, funded the construction of railway. So it was it was a mutiny of the army uh, for national pride against the Westerners that led to the demise of the Chinese Empire and the advent of the Chinese Republic in 1911. So this is something that Xi Jinping had in mind when he heard that there was a new virus coming from Wuhan. Another thing that came to his mind was that Wuhan had also been chosen um, by uh, the predecessor of, of uh, 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 Xi Jinping, who is uh, Hu Jintao, is another engineer. All these uh, big Chinese leaders are engineers. It has been chosen in 2004 uh, to build um, a, a biosecurity uh, level four lab, a P4 lab, uh, uh, which is the only lab uh, in, in China where you can, where you can uh, manipulate uh, very dangerous pathogens like uh, H5N1, SARS, Ebola. Uh, and this uh, lab has been built with uh, the uh, collaboration of uh, French researchers who had all also built a similar lab in, in Lyon. And this has been um, criticized by the United States, uh, who have about half of the P4 lab in the world, and who were very reluctant to see China having a P4 lab uh, where they could basically build, in their view, biological weapons. So when there was this, this uh, uh, information about the emergence of a, a new virus from bats in Wuhan, there were a lot of controversies about the fact that this was a site of collaboration with Westerners producing dangerous technologies and that it could, this could lead to a new revolution against Xi Jinping. That's why this also explains the strength of the reaction of Xi Jinping, who has succeeded in transforming a major uh, threat for his, for his government into, into an asset in his uh, uh, attempt to control uh, the Chinese societies through technologies of surveillance. So the questions I want to ask uh, are, are, are um, coming from, from the conceptual structure of my book. So the, the first question I want to ask, rather than the question of uh, who has built this virus? I mean, what is the origin of the virus? Is it, is it human made? Is it animal made? Uh, can we think that, that the, the bats have revenge against nature or against, against humans? Or that, that the Americans have uh, uh, revenged against the Chinese by introducing a dangerous pathogen in a laboratory coming made by, by, by the French. So rather than engaging in this debate it's about origins, since as we know as anthropologists that you can never, you never close debates about origins, I uh, want to take the debate as a technological question. And the question is, can Wuhan become a sentinel post for pandemic preparedness in inner China? The hypothesis is that when the Chinese built this laboratory in Wuhan, they wanted to uh, 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 replace Hong Kong as a sentinel post for respiratory diseases by Wuhan, because they control Wuhan, basically. So that's the first question. The second question is, are uh, Chinese physicians um, trained enough by simulations of pandemic? So this is a picture I took in Hong Kong, where uh, every year uh, the um, uh, Center for Health Protection, which is a, an administration dedicated to uh, uh, health emergencies, organizes a simulation of uh, pandemics. And this is something on which Mara and also Sandrine Revet have, uh, have worked a lot and we have exchanged a lot. Um, these exercises bear the names of trees, exercise redwood. Uh, they hire uh, 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 voluntaries uh, who play the patients. And then uh, the hospital staff play their own role based on a scenario. And what they basically have to do is to do triage of patients to detect those who have pandemic influenza and those who have regular respiratory diseases. And the idea of these uh, simulations is that the, the very complex emotional, uh, the very complex gestures you have to do in a situation of emergency, which we produce a lot of emotion, such as, for example, triage of patients, 
uh, 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 are done on a regular basis and then so that the emotion is controlled uh, uh, um, uh, in, in this uh, scenario and, and um, in, so in such a way that the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic, the emotions of the pandemic can be, can be managed. The third question I want to ask is, uh, are vaccines applied for SARS available against the new coronavirus? This was a time when the question about masks was not raised so heavily as today. And um, uh, uh, so every time there is a new uh, virus emerging, uh, we, have, we, we need to ask if the, the vaccines available are, uh, 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 can be used for this new uh, virus. This is a question that is particularly asked for flu viruses because flu viruses mutate a lot. Coronaviruses don't mutate so much. Um, uh, and, and so uh, this is a, a picture of the US national stockpile uh, that has been built by this guy, Edwin Kilburn, in the 1970s, after what is uh, famous as the swine flu fiasco, when the US po population, 10% uh, of the US population was vaccinated against a, a new H1N1 virus. They were, uh, and then it stopped because there were some uh, side effects, uh, very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, and so the, the idea was that uh, the, the vaccine should be stockpiled and um, adapted to the new uh, virus, and that decisions should be taken on who should receive these vaccines uh, as a priority target. So it's a question of distribution, uh, questions of priority, questions of equity. Uh, now, these questions are also asked about antivirals, and we have all, all this debate about chloroquine, uh, and also about masks. So this is the framework that I've built for the flu viruses and that in some way, I think, applies to the emergence of uh, the, the coronavirus. What I study um, is techniques uh, of uh, pandemic preparedness. Uh, and this is based on the work I've done with uh, Andrew Lakoff and Stephen Collier, who have studied the genealogy of techniques of preparedness in the US after uh, um, 1945 in the context of the Cold War, and then the, the transfer from the anticipation of a nuclear attack to uh, what, what, what is called um, a generic threats or uh, all kinds of all, all, all hazards, that is uh, uh, natural disasters, uh, terrorist attacks, and then also pandemics. So there are three techniques that I uh, distinguish and that I call synergetic because I, 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 I try to show that they rely on competencies of hunter societies. And uh, these techniques are sentinel, simulation, and storage. I call them the three S, and they are doubled into uh, uh, another series of three S, which I call pastoral techniques. And the hypothesis is that all the debates we have about preparedness is because we make, distinct, we make confusion between synergetic techniques and pastoral techniques. So for example, sentinel, we have debate about sacrifice. How many people should sacrifice themselves, or how many animals should be sacrificed to raise alert? For simulation, uh, there are debates about scenarios, how realistic are scenarios? Uh, um, uh, do they come from film? Do they come from theater? And then for, for storage, there are debates about stockpiling, which is the debate about the priority order of the distribution of, of the vaccines, masks, and, and antivirals. So I studied each of these three uh, techniques in three different ethnographic sites, even if they were combined, of course, in this ethnographic site, uh, which I call precisely sentinel post. So the sentinel post that I mostly study is Hong Kong. Um, and I will come back to that in the next slides. Uh, the, the simulations I've studied mostly in Singapore because Singapore has been uh, uh, technologically equipped to simulate pandemics, both uh, in uh, desktop exercises or computer uh, scenarios, and also in real ground uh, fields uh, or uh, uh, theater scenarios. And then storage, I, I studied a lot in Taiwan because Taiwan has a strong pharmaceutical industry. And also, as we know, C uh, is very good at producing masks. Uh, so this is the three uh, ethnographic sites where I've done my field work. And for each of these uh, oh, uh, techniques of preparedness, I raise a philosophical problem. The problem for Sentinel is truth. What is a true alert? Uh, what is a false alert? The problem for simulation is reality. Is the scenario realistic enough? Uh, and the problem of storage is equity. 
Uh, how can we distribute uh, scarce resources in such a way that doesn't produce inequality? And then uh, I also say that each of these three techniques raises problems that have been um, uh, approached in anthropology uh, with the notions of myth, ritual, and exchange. So Sentinel is the question of origin uh, and origin in the relations between humans and animals, coming back to a time when humans and animals were not separated. And the separation has, could, has caused a lot of harm. And so how can we come back to this time? So that's the problem of myth. And then this myth can be studied in their transformation, as Levi Strauss showed. And then simulation, uh, the question of ritual, that is how you shift from the ordinary to the extraordinary by a, a, a sequence of action that is repeated and that helps humans to control their emotions, particularly in relations to invisible beings, uh, such as microbes and, and also animals. And then storage raises the question of exchange, uh, since uh, we know since Marcel Mauss that we exchange goods that are also uh, 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 gifts, uh, gifts in the sense of uh, good things, but also poisons. And so a virus can be transformed into a vaccine. Uh, uh, and so the circulation of virus is duplicated by the circulation of uh, vaccines, and that's the circulation of the gifts. Uh, so all the, all the main domains of anthropology are kind of represented in the debates about these three techniques of preparedness. Now, uh, um, I will present the, the, the main argument of the book, and I, I hope we can discuss that. And I, I will read that uh, uh, quickly, uh, um, and we can come back, of course, because it's, it's quite compact. So the, 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 my, my position is to combine an anthropology of biosecurity, that is the study of techniques of preparedness in contemporary global societies, with the ontological turn that has been taken by anthropologists, mostly the study of uh, 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 hunter societies or societies that have magical techniques. I'm thinking about Holbrad, Pedersen, um, Viveros de Castro, Eduardo Cohn. So the idea is that sentinel devices should not be described uh, only through a naturalistic ontology of the quantitative measure of risk and threat, but also and mostly through an animistic ontology that takes the perspective of birds on the threats that affect them before affecting humans, which is the idea of taking seriously the idea of virus hunters as taking the perspective of birds on, on human disease through viruses. Second point is that human and non-human animals communicate through sentinel devices as hunters communicate with their prey in animistic societies. Third point is that spatial techniques of preparedness mix the animistic ontology of synergetic techniques with the naturalistic ontology of capitalism in an analogistic ontology regulated by sacrifice. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to that, but that explains the title of the book. And now I want to give you in the last 15, 20 minutes, uh, some ethnographic cases from, uh, mostly from Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is this British colony that was designed first as a, as a harbor and then as a, as a, as a garrison or entrepot uh, for, for commodities from South China and then as a, as a, as a, as a kind of capitalist dream uh, of uh, commodities made in Hong Kong by Chinese refugees for low cost and then as a financial center uh, to a sentinel post for uh, influenza uh, pandemics because um, that's the space where uh, flu viruses emerging among uh, 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 birds, I mean, wild birds, domestic poultry, and pigs in South China uh, are transmitted by a hub of uh, uh, persons and goods uh, to the rest of the world. So of course, it's the, 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 co the coincidence or the conflict, the conflation between this image. We, these are two pictures that I took, so this image of a, a farm in, in the Guangzhou area with chickens and pigs, and this image of the, the, the harbor of Hong Kong uh, with its, its, finance, its financial center. And this is the diagram that virologists build when they want to explain how pandemic viruses, pandemic flu viruses emerge. The idea is that you have seasonal flu, which is only through humans and to which our bodies are immune. So all, all, mostly uh, elderly people die from seasonal flu. And then there are pandemic flu which emerge every 20 or 30 years because they are transmitted from 
uh, uh, wild birds to domestic poultry to humans, sometimes going through pigs because pigs have respiratory tracts that, are, that have uh, 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 receptors for flu viruses coming from birds and flu viruses coming from humans. They are the mixing vessel, if you want. So this is a diagram that has been built by this community of experts in the 1970s. Um, they are mostly Australian because Australia is um, one of the countries where this ecology of infectious diseases has been invented by Frank McFarlane Burnett, who was an immunologist trained in Cambridge. And uh, Burnett made the hypothesis that uh, flu viruses are transmitted from birds to humans because he was working on the uh, vaccine for flu with chicken eggs. But two of his students, Robert Webster and Graham Lever, who you see on the, on the right, made the hypothesis that wild birds carry flu viruses. That they, so they tested wild birds uh, uh, to find antibodies for flu viruses. And then they started hunting birds all over the world, from Australia to Europe, to China, US, um, to uh, map the uh, mutations of flu viruses. And, um, uh, and they reported that to WHO, because WHO had this committee on the ecology of infectious diseases, uh, whose goal was to anticipate the next pandemic by connecting all the laboratories working on flu viruses in humans and, and in animals. And that's the reason why this uh, committee was uh, uh, headed by a veterinarian uh, the, who, whose name is Martin Kaplan, who was the chief veterinary officer of WHO at the time. The other guy was uh, behind uh, uh, the chairman and who looks like Bruno Latour in some way is uh, Kennedy Shortridge. Shortridge was also trained uh, with Robert Webster and Graham Lever in, in Canberra in Australia by Burnett and he went to Hong Kong to open the Department of Microbiology in 1972 with the idea that uh, he would collect uh, flu viruses uh, from birds and pigs in, in South China. China, China, China. China was not member of WHO at that time, so it was very difficult to know what was going on in China. And his hypothesis was that since the, 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 the last pandemics had emerged in China, 1957, uh, killing 1 million people, uh, sorry, 2 million people, 1957 uh, and 1968, killing uh, 1 million people, his idea was that the new pandemic would emerge in South China because South China was the site of a dense relationship between birds, pigs, and humans. Um, and so he made the hypothesis that South China was the influenza epicenter uh, 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 that would uh, 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 bring the new pandemic to emerge. So the scenario uh, built by Australian uh, uh, microbiologists was confirmed in 1997 at the very time of the endeavor of the um, uh, 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 British colony to mainland China. So at, at, at the time of, of major fears, on what would happen to the Hong Kong population after it would become part of the Chinese Republic under the, 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 the rule, uh, one country, two systems. Uh, at the beginning of 1997, so before the handover uh, uh, in February, uh, uh, 5,000 chickens and uh, 12 people, 12 humans, were infected by a new flu virus. And among these uh, 12 people, uh, eight of them died. So it was a very high lethality rate, uh, about 60, 65%. If you remember, the, the most lethal uh, emerging pathogen is Ebola in Central Africa that kills about 90% of the people it infects. And uh, so that's why SARS is only 10%, and uh, uh, coronavirus is only 1%. So h 5 one was very lethal. But it was very, it was very little, uh, not, not very contagious. Uh, so, uh, uh, in, in the in the years after 1997, it affected about uh, 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 8,000 people and killing 500. But there was a major fear at that time that it will cause a pandemic if it successfully spread from human to human. And there were some clusters where there were doubts that it spread from human to human. But mostly, it was a a, a, a bird a bird disease. 
with some cases of, of children and adults infected when they were playing with, with chicken feathers. What was very striking at that time was that the, the head of the health department of Hong Kong, Margaret Chan, uh, was uh, advised by uh, um, one of the experts in influenza at the Chinese CDC, uh, sorry, at the, at the US CDC in Atlanta, Keiji Fukuda, uh, who, who is Japanese, but, but Japanese American, so born in the US. And these two, these two persons managed the H5N1 outbreak in Hong Kong in 1997. So they, they basically killed all the live poultry on the Hong Kong territory, 1.5 million, which was a traumatic measure for uh, uh, Hong Kong citizens who were very attached to their backyard poultry. And uh, it's very striking that uh, Margaret Chan was also in charge of the SARS uh, crisis in 2003. And then she had to step down because she was kind of criticized for her management of uh, the SARS crisis. But then she was supported by the Beijing government to become the head of WHO in 2006. And Keiji Fukuda was the uh, vice president of WHO when Margaret Chan was, was the president. So you see that these two persons uh, who took these very strong measures in 1997 were basically the two persons who decided on the regulation of pandemics after 2006. Now, there were a, a series of SARS heroes who basically made the major findings on the SARS virus at a very, very quick rate. And SARS is remembered in Hong Kong, but also in, 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 in Atlanta, in Geneva, as a success story for science, because the speed of discoveries uh, uh, which also coincided with uh, the, the, the fall of the epidemic uh, was really, really a, a major success. So this is a picture that I took at the Hong Kong Medical History Museum. Uh, so it's a museum dedicated to, to big discoveries in, in medicine, such as Alexander Yersin is covering the bacillus of, pay, of plague in 1894, or dentistry making big discoveries or surgery. And then, and then you have all this room about SARS and you have this picture about the microbiology department. So you see this, um, uh, this department had, had, had become a very uh, sinicized. So, so not, it was white, in, uh, mostly white in, in 1972 when it was built by Kennedy Shortridge. And then Shortridge and Webster hired in 1997, a series of uh, experts coming from the Asian world. So one of them is Guanyi, uh, who comes from Jiangsu province, uh, a very rural province, who fled China in 1989 uh, to train with Robert Webster in the US, then came back to Hong Kong in 1997 to study flu viruses among pigs. And then in, in 2003, he, he, found, he went to China because he was Chinese, uh, and he, he, he found that the, <clears throat> the, the virus was carried by butchers in uh, animal markets. And then it traced the origins of the coronavirus in, in bats in South China. The second guy, KY Yuan, was the head of the microbiology department at that time. And um, he was a surgeon working for the Hong Kong police. He's a, a Hong Kong, a very wealthy Hong Kong family. And he's also one of the authors of the uh, WHO uh, report of the 28th of February, still major figure in, in Hong Kong, advi advising the government uh, with, with a, a, a lot of diplomacy with, with China. Uh, and, and he's the one who's basically supervised all the operations between Hong Kong and, and, and Guangzhou at the time of SARS. Uh, the third guy is John Nichols, who was a pathologist. So as you see, he's the only white guy in the, in the team. Uh, who, who studied uh, basically the, the, the impact of the, of the SARS virus on, on patients. Uh, the fourth is Malik Peris um, uh, at the center because he made the major uh, discovery of identifying the coronavirus among, uh, uh, in, in, in monkey cells, uh, which was a major discovery because nobody knew at the time that coronaviruses could, uh, could, could mutate and shift from animals to humans. And then the two other guys, Hong Li Chen and, uh, with Chinese and Liu Pun with, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, were uh, doing the technical operations that helped these discoveries to, to, to be made. So these are the SARS heroes. And, and these guys appeared on the media uh, 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 every day at the time of the SARS crisis, often with masks. 
and they are still very popular figures in Hong Kong. And I work mostly with Malik Paris, who was the head of the uh, Pasteur Center in Hong Kong at the time uh, when I was doing my PhD. So the SARS crisis, the h 5 n one these are emergency crises. These are times when you have heroes. Now, when you, when you study what virologists do on a more regular basis, what they do is collect samples of viruses uh, okay. in Chinese markets. Okay. So these are uh, um, uh, uh, veterinarians and, and virologists uh, who go to uh, Chinese markets and take samples from uh, uh, ducks and geese and quails and chickens. And these are uh, um, a, a team of uh, 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 biologists who do sequencing and then they analyze uh, sequences on the databases, on the, on the data bank, on the gen bank. Uh, and they are, as you see, Australian and Indian. Uh, and so what they do uh, is uh, build these phylogenetic trees that allow them to see the mutations of the virus and anticipate the next uh, mutation. Um, this is a picture that I took uh, in a farm where I worked in Hong Kong. It was a farm that was affected uh, in um, uh, 2009, uh, sorry, 2008, and I did field work in 2009. Okay. And um, uh, they, uh, um, the, 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 the virus, the farm, sorry, was uh, um, uh, inspected by KY Yuan, the head of the microbiology department. So that's why I called the pastoral farmer with the virus hunters. Uh, the pastoral farmer is this farmer, uh, Wang Yichan, uh, uh, who um, owned three farms, um, one in Hong Kong and two in uh, Shenzhen, uh, and uh, with about 30,000 chickens in each farm, and who knew that chicken farming was a risky business, but as he said, it was a good business and he was ready to take risks. And in his farms, as in all uh, poultry farms, there are 30 poultry farms in Hong Kong uh, still today, basically because Hong Kong consumers like to, to buy chickens made in Hong Kong. They think it's, they're much better than, than ch Chinese uh, chickens. Uh, uh, so uh, if you want to, to raise chicken in Hong Kong, you need to keep uh, uh, chickens, some chickens unvaccinated uh, because these unvaccinated chickens are the ones who die first when uh, flu virus infects the farm. And uh, uh, they are called sentinel chickens because they are the first to die on the on the, on the front line uh, uh, of the enemy with the virus. And it's very interesting that the Chinese term for a sentinel chicken is Xiaobingji, which means chicken who die, sorry, chickens who whistle like soldiers. So this is all this uh, anthropomorphization of, of, of animals as allies in the fight against the virus. So this is all the work I've done with virologists and chicken farmers on farms, markets, and also borders where the export of poultry from China is, is regulated. I've also worked a lot with bird watchers um, because they had more time than virologists to talk with the anthropologists, but also because they had very interesting perspectives on birds. So um, uh, when I arrived in Hong Kong in 2007, uh, I sent an email to the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society and they sent me this map and they said, well, we, we want to tell you about um, uh, uh, H5N1 because we have communicated with, we have communicated with journalists on uh, uh, H5N1 in wild birds. And we want to show the government that H5N1 in wild birds is not, is not found in, in natural reserves where we do bird watching, but it, they can be found in the, in, in the bird market in the central area of, of, of Hong Kong, which is Kowloon, probably one of the most dense areas of the world, um, which is also the site where uh, the SARS outbreak uh, uh, emerged in 2003. Um, uh, and so they wanted to tell the government that when there was uh, H5N1 on a, uh, on, a, on a wild bird, they shouldn't close like this reserve, Maipo, which is on the Pearl River Delta, or the forest here, or the islands where they do a lot of bird watching, but they should close the bird market. So there was this controversy that the H5N1 come from migratory birds and from uh, wild bird trade. The Hong Kong Bird Watching Society is a very interesting uh, object of study for history of sciences because it's an association founded in 1957 by British officers who were going to uh, uh, the, the, the border with China 
um, and to to see if uh, refugees would come or if the, if, if the Chinese army would invade uh, the British colony. And while they were monitoring the border, they could also watch birds because there are 500 uh, bird species coming from the north of uh, the Chinese Sea uh, that, that come uh, every uh, winter uh, in these wetlands. Um, in 1997, when the British colony became Chinese again, uh, the majority of its members became Chinese and it was, the head also was Chinese. Um, they were doing uh, monitoring of biodiversity for the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department. And they were very successful in two projects. Uh, one is to defend Long Valley against the construction of a railroad. So you see on the previous maps, this is a railroad that goes from Kowloon to uh, Guangzhou through Shenzhen. Uh, and the, the project of the government was to build this railway across this rice culture. And they were successful in showing that there were bird species that could be found on this rice culture and that couldn't, couldn't be found um, on other parts of Hong Kong. And that's why you have this uh, black-faced spoonbill, which is a, a, a protected species in, in Hong Kong, saying to the, to the truck uh, uh, that they, 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 they succeeded and the, the truck says, I'll be back. Uh, and, uh, and then their second success was to defend uh, Maipo against the closure by the government and they even instru instrumentalized me as an anthropologist because I organized a, a workshop with them uh, on, on, on this question, uh, H5N1, does it come from migratory birds or from wild bird trend? They were representatives of the government. And after not only this workshop, but also uh, all kinds of communications, press and media, uh, they were successful in, in uh, not having their reserve closed every time there was an H5N1 found on a wild bird. Now, what is very interesting in, the, in their uh, uh, public communication strategy is that they, they targeted a, a traditional practice uh, to which uh, Chinese uh, citizens are very attached, which is function, which is the idea of releasing animals in mercy, uh, in, mer in mercy for, uh, for, for the goods that animals uh, make. Um, and you see in the Hong Kong bird market, uh, these uh, little cages with sparrows uh, sold for function for a few dollars. Um, and so function literally means release life or let live, uh, which when you come from Michel Foucault's ideas about uh, sovereign power uh, having the right to decide uh, to uh, uh, make to die and let live is very interesting because basically the Chinese government made die a lot of birds and then let the Buddhists uh, release these this, this birds as a, as a compensation. But what the bird watchers showed is that this, 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 this bird and they were released in natural parks with, with Buddhist practitioners uh, and Buddhist monks um, uh, some of them died, uh, a lot of them died, uh, either by um, uh, uh, all kinds of diseases, uh, most, most of them by stress because they were stuck into cages for a long time, and some of them with, uh, with uh, flu viruses. So there was a risk of transmission uh, uh, of, of raising, by raising uh, birds. And what the bird watch did was to say, uh, we, can, we can do uh, bird release in a scientific way. <clears throat> we can release birds that we, that we trap, and then we put them a GPS antenna and then we follow their migration and we make sure that they survive. Um, and then and thus we protect the species because we communicate with other bird watchers who follow their migration along the, uh, the Chinese sea. And that's these two books. Uh, the contrast between these two books is quite interesting because this is the, the, the religious book, the, the religious Buddhist book, it's called Function Shu Shu, which means a uh, uh, handbook for raising life. And then this is Kershui function Shoshu, which means a scientific way to uh, release life, which basically indicates, so the first book is about prayers that you should do to Buddha uh, to, uh, when you release uh, animals. And the second is about the knowledge of the environments in which you can safely release animals. Okay, so I still have uh, two slides, I think, uh, three slides. Um, so what I wanted to do uh, with this ethnography of Hong Kong was a study of human animal relationships through sentinel devices. That is all the techniques that uh, poultry farmers and bird watchers build to uh, 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 make relations with birds by the control of the viruses we share with them. 
And this study of Sentinel devices can be made at a very local ethnographic level, but they can also be made at, at a global level, because as you can see on this map, uh, the transmission of H5N1 is global, uh, even if it does not reach the, uh, the American continent. And you can also use the concept of Sentinel. So basically, Hong Kong is a Sentinel post for the rest of the world, in a way very similar to a chicken farm in Hong Kong for the rest of the territory. So there's an interesting analogy here. And you can, you can follow the analogy not only from the local to the global, but also at the level below the local, which is the level of the human organism or the, or the organism in general, which is the level of sentinel cells. So the idea, and that's the cover of the book that you use uh, for the poster uh, of the book in French, uh, there, are there are cells in our body that have the same shape as the cells in our brain. They, they have arms, they are like synapses. Uh, they are called dendritic, dendritic cells dendritic cells because, or sentinel cells, because uh, they capture the information of viruses so that when the, when the virus enters the body, uh, the, the information of the virus is transmitted to the proper immune cell that can digest the information. Uh, 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 and if the, if the sentinel cells are lured or bypassed, the hypothesis of virologists is, then that, is that then the virus will, in, will, will infect or invade uh, uh, cells that cannot make with the information, that cannot cope with the information, that don't recognize the information. And these cells trigger an inflammatory response of the immune system that will then lead to the death of the body. So the, 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 the most important uh, uh, lesson is that the, the body doesn't die of the virus itself, as we as we now see with, with major cases of uh, coronavirus patients, the body dies of an improper immune response uh, uh, or improper inflammatory response of the immune system. Okay, so we can debate that, but the idea is that at all levels, at these three levels, uh, a proper response is when uh, the sentinel cells do their work of identify, identif identifying uh, viruses and having the proper uh, 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 early warning uh, signal and early uh, response. And to understand this uh, uh, phenomenon, I rely on the work of an uh, Israeli ornithologist with whom uh, Vincent Desprez, who is a, a famous uh, a philosopher of science and, and sociologist of science in, in Belgium, has worked uh, in the 1990s. And, and, uh, and this, this ornithologist sadly passed away two, two years ago. So the idea of, of Zahavi, who worked also with uh, immunologists in Israel, is that uh, uh, there, are, there are birds that, are, that have sentinel behaviors. And these birds he observed in the Negev desert uh, when he was doing his uh, military uh, office uh, uh, for the Israeli army. Uh, these, uh, uh, these birds, uh, when, they, uh, when they see a predator, uh, instead of one bird going on, on the branch of a tree and then uh, uh, singing very loudly, uh, then uh, uh, to, to, to warn, to warn the others that they should flee, the other birds. Uh, uh, instead of that, you have uh, uh, many birds who go on the same branch and they sing different songs. And so there is a choir or a dance of, of sentinel birds. And the idea of Zahavi is that um, uh, instead of the bird sacrificing itself uh, to allow others to escape the predator, the sentinel birds communicate both with the predator saying, we've seen you. It's, you have no chance to, to fight against us. We've seen you. We, we, we're more numerous than you. And they also communicate with the other birds, mostly females. This is a very sexual uh, uh, agenda here. Uh, communicate with the, with the other birds to say, look, I'm strong enough. I can, I can defy the predator. And I think this is very similar to the situation we, we're meeting today with the, with the flu, with the coronavirus. And this is, so this is summarizing uh, Zahavi's handicap principle, which is a major contribution to neo-Darwinian uh, uh, biology. Okay, I will not talk about that. I have hypotheses about bird reserves and, uh, and museums, but I will not go into this. We can come back to that if you want. This is the final slide. I'm sorry for taking a little more time than I expected. And I will just read that and then we can uh, uh, open the discussion. So the three points of my conclusion are the followings. Avian reservoirs are not stigmatizing Asian populations for their association with animals in wet markets, 
they are sites of intense human animal relations and interspecies communication, signaling common environmental threats. Second point, avian reservoirs are epidemiological sites of surveillance where future pandemics are imagined and simulated, but also aesthetic resources for the conservation of past information and materialities like cultural museums and natural reserves. Third point, avian reservoirs are critical sites where the sacrificial interventions of pastoral power are resisted by perspective exchange between various hunters and sentinel birds. And so I, I thank you all for your attention and I open the floor for questions. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Frederic. <laughs> we had a very stimulated speech and dance. Uh, I think your research is a good opportunity for all of us to start thinking, uh, start thinking on what is going on on different scales, uh, contest, and also different levels of analysis. Uh, while we are uh, called to deal with pandemics and human-animal diseases worldwide, and uh, I, I, I want to use uh, just a few minutes for a single question before leaving the floor to the others. Uh, in your books, uh, uh, you, in articles, you encourage, and you also say this uh, today, you encourage to see pathogens from the perspective of animal, animals themselves. And following this provocation today, we titled this first speaker's corner with the question, what do bad think? think of the virus. Uh, now uh, we are uh, moving toward the phase two uh, uh, in response to the current pandemic. And I would like to, to move our reasoning one step beyond two. And um, in many European countries, uh, in Italy and probably also in, in, in France, uh, there is lots of talk in these days on how to live with the virus from now to the following months. And it's uh, on this, I would, uh, uh, I would like to, to dwell a, a little bit more on the word uh, live with, uh, live with in the sense of coexistence with the virus. Uh, you as anthropologists have referred to animal diseases in order to think about different dimensions of society. You clearly explained today what you did in your previous research. Uh, uh, my question is, how can we now, uh, uh, during this current pandemic, uh, use the, 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 um, the disease and the pandemic itself uh, to reframe concept of uh, causality and relatedness, uh, reflecting different modes of coexistence between humans and viruses, between humans and animals, between humans and the, and the environment more generally? Is it possible to imagine a phase of real coexistence, taking this term seriously? Uh, and how can we make this coexistence viable in our everyday life? I mean, if we consider all the ambivalent debates about precaution, sovereignty, and equity that are accompanying us in these days, do you think that we can really make this coexistence viable and in uh, which way? We will uh, leave you the, the um, uh, possibility to reply now because uh, uh, the others, uh, I, then I will leave the floor to Luca Rimoldi that is uh, uh, facilitating the debate and uh, will collect uh, the request uh, of uh, uh, the participants. Uh, all the participants, uh, while you are responding to the, the, this first question, can uh, reply to this first question, can uh, send messages privately to Luca Rimoldi uh, in order to 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 ask for uh, for the possibility to speak, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mara, for this question. Um, so I I would answer to the question of uh, what coexistence means with viruses at the time of precautionary measures, uh, and and take your question on causality, because yeah. that's the question I've thought a lot about when I, I, I did my PhD on Lucien Levy Brule, who was one of the main thinkers about causality, in anthropology, the magical causality and things like that. So the idea is that um, precautionary measures 
uh, take a linear view of causality because they, they basically see viruses as emerging from bats to pangolins and then from Chinese to Italian and then French and then the idea is to stop right it's it's a linear it's, it's a it's a it's a linear view of causality so you need to stop you need to make a barrier and the precautionary measure is uh, the, the the harder you hit uh, the the stronger is the effect on the causality right uh, and that's why you you make epidemiological models of what would happen if you don't do hard measures of precaution whereas uh, the 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 view i take is um, is a more holistic view of causality where precisely we live with viruses we, we know that 99 percent of viruses are not lethal for humans and that our bodies uh, ha have a lot of viruses and, ma and bacteria and fungi that play a role in all kinds of biological functions including pregnancy digestion right uh, all most of our relationships to alterity uh, are possible because we have um, assimilated viruses and bacteria through a long-term evolution of the human species and mammal species so if we take this holistic view of, of of viruses of the coexistence between humans and viruses of course this looks like a new age view you know like you would oppose the new age view of living with viruses to the linear you know, sovereign view of cutting, cutting relations with viruses and, and bats and all that. But this is not a new age view. This is, this is the scientific truth. Uh, uh, this is, uh, and, and so my idea is that this scientific view of viruses, this is all the research on the microbiome or the virome. This scientific view of the virus is more compatible with preparedness. Because preparedness is precisely about imagining the worst with viruses in order to better life, uh, imagining the worst with viruses in the future to have a better life with viruses in the present. So you imagine that a new virus is coming from bats or from birds, and, and, and you imagine that it's going to trigger this, this crazy immune response. But if you take the good measures at the right time if you if you implement the good sentinel devices at all levels then you can have a better life with the viruses and the microbes we live with so that's why i my argument and that's that's a, a, a big debate with a lot of anthropologists to work on preparedness because most a lot of anthropologists think that preparedness is, is actually fostering the views of the sovereign state because it's based on the politics of fear right and it's serving the interest of uh, neoliberal government who want to sell vaccines and masks and uh, antivirals. But my argument is that the imaginary of preparedness is more consonant with the views of microbiologists who think about our coexistence with viruses today. And the second part of the argument, which is even harder to make, is that virologists have this view as this imaginary, imaginary about our coexistence with viruses because they think like hunters because what they do is take the perspective of animals through viruses in the same way as as hunters regulate the ecology of their environment that in the environment in which they hunt through a communication with the invisible entities that animals send so it's it's it, you, you so it's all this the tours that I make through anthropology to basically foster the view of living with viruses that a lot of biologists make. Thank you, Frédéric. I think there is lots of uh, space for uh, debating now <laughs> after your final uh, arguments. And I will leave the, the, the floor to uh, Luca Rimoldi and then uh, to the others. Luca, are you here? Uh, yes, uh, I'm collecting some questions. And there's a lot of questions, so uh, uh, I have a question to ask too, but I think I will leave space to our guests, if you don't mind. And I leave the floor to Lorenzo Dorsi. 
hi to everybody. Uh, do you hear me? Hi, Cedric. Um, uh, so I really would like to thank you for your exciting presentation. And in the light also of, um, on your last answer, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in these imaginaries of preparedness, no? that is also at the core of your book. Um, and I would like to know if you can tell something more, or for example, if you perceive that there is a difference, for example, in the imaginaries of preparedness. No? I mean, you study the, this uh, preparedness uh, in relation to the post-Avian flu, uh, and how it affected uh, on the political, cultural, and moral perception, I mean, of the current south covid uh, to uh, pandemic. And if you find that there is a difference in how these imaginaries of preparedness, um, I mean, has been shaped in, in Asia, in China, I mean, in the, in the realities we study, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, and here in the West. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So the argument of my book is that preparedness is a global norm. So it's uh, fostered by WHO after 2006 under the supervision of Margaret Chan. It comes from the US. Um, Andy Lakoff and others have showed how Bill Clinton implemented biosecurity and preparedness for pandemics uh, 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 very high on the agenda of the US after the end of the, the Cold War. But my, 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 my argument as an anthropologist is to understand, is there a Chinese version of preparedness? That's the idea of Asian reservoirs. How do, how do Asian society, so it's not only Chinese, it's not linked to the language, it's really linked to the, to the experience that, that Asian populations have had with, basically I would say the disasters of the 20th century, as they are uh, 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 um, transmitted from one generation to the other. And the argument I, I make, uh, which is also based on the dialogue with uh, Andy Lakoff, is that Europe and the US, mostly Europe, um, have failed to understand what preparedness really means because they were, um, uh, they were focused on prevention. Prevention has been in Europe the main way to anticipate the future based on risk calculation, uh, social insurance, uh, mutualization uh, of risk. Um, because basically the French, sorry, uh, modern, the modern state has been built in the 19th century through the calculation of risk by statistics uh, on sovereign territories. Um, and that, that was the birth of social security, all the things that we are attached to as members of nation states in Europe. The problem is that when, when the social state has been criticized in the 1970s, um, then neoliberal policies that have impacted so much the, the, the welfare state have been replaced by politics of precaution. Um, and so I argue with Andy Lakoff that the precaution and Paul Rabino that, that the precautionary principle is what remains of prevention when the welfare state stops doing its work of the mutualization of risk through social security. And so the precautionary measure is basically what, what I uh, described as cutting, cutting the line, uh, uh, doing sovereign gestures. That, that, that remake sovereignty at the time when basically the state doesn't do its work of social security. And, and so the, the idea is that precaution becomes, pre, sorry, prevention becomes precaution at the time when a new rationality emerges, which is preparedness, which is the idea to prepare for events whose probability cannot be calculated but whose consequences will be disastrous. And so the idea is that if you imagine the disaster, then you will mitigate its consequences. But you need to imagine that. And the imagination of the disaster uh, 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 is, uh, in, is, is inscribed in a series of techniques, which, are, which I call techniques of preparedness, like sentinels, simulations, stockpiling. 
And I think the reason why European states have not taken seriously techniques of preparedness, they just done that to show that they were good pupils at the level of the great show. Uh, but, but, you know, after the H1N1 virus in France, we stopped buying masks or we didn't, we, we, we didn't, um, re, re, um, um, uh, okay, uh, re renovate, ma re um, sorry, I missed the, the, the term in English. So the, the, the idea is that after SARS, Asian societies invested a lot in preparedness. They, they, they bought masks, antiviral vaccines, they did simulation, they implemented Sentinel devices. And the reason why they did that is that, it's, is that precisely they had not had prevention before or not at the level at which it was developed by social nation states in Europe. Um, and, and my argument is that they could invest in preparedness because they were not and so that's the technical argument. And then there's the ontological level of the argument is that Asian societies could invest so much in preparedness because they did not rely on the separation between nature and culture, which is so strong in the implementation of the precautionary principle. Because to implement the precautionary principle, you need to make a distinction between humans and animals. So you can do things to animals that you cannot do to humans. And that's the reason why we are so we are so uh, uh, awkward with, with lockdown because we have locked down animals for decades and now we lock down humans and we don't know what to do with the lockdown. So that would be my answer. Okay, thank you. I uh, give the floor to Elizabeth Krause. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I was startled. I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, ready to be called on. <laughs> it's just one of the awkward, awkward aspects of, of Zoom is uh, it's, it's remote, but thank you so much. That was um, just an incredible, incredible kind of mind blowing talk. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really, um, my question has sort of changed as, 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 as you uh, gave your answer, but, but I was just really, uh, struck because your answer about uh, thinking about the imaginary and living with, uh, oh, sorry, um, just just the 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 critique that you made of sort of the neoliberal state and the concerns that a lot of us have with surveillance. You know, so many, so so much of what I've read of people who do, like the who are really embracing the ontological turn. Um, it seems to often be very anti-science, and I think you're you're making this move that that I find really productive and fascinating, and I, I can't wait to read your book, honestly. Um, so my question is actually really simple and a little bit playful. Oh, let, let me say one more thing. Um, there was just about preparedness. Um, the president of Brown University. I'm here at uh, in in Amherst, Massachusetts. And the president of Brown University just, just wrote a really controversial uh, opinion piece in the New York Times about how uh, American universities must do everything that they can to open in the fall. And it's just like, it, it, anyway, um, your, your comments about preparedness and, and sort of coexistence, I think um, the pushback against her article and her way of thinking uh, really reveals <laughs> that we're a long way from embracing this coexistence kind of idea with the virus, at least here in the U.S. Um, but my question is very simple, and and your your title of your talk is, was what what do bats think, right, about the coronavirus? And I wondered if you could say a little more about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Frederic. Maybe we can collect some more questions and then. Mm -hmm. you answer. So I give the speech to Irene Falconieri. Irene. Okay. okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, so my question, uh, uh, many scholars claim uh, that in the near future, pandemics could become uh, a recurring phenomenon in, in uh, everyday life. Considering uh, this prediction uh, realistic, uh, in a future scenario similar to, to present one, do you think that social science uh, 
an anthropological, an anthropology in particular, can play a public role. Uh, if so, uh, which one? Thank you. So I give you the floor to Nadia Breda. Hi. Uh, bon, bonjour. Um, bonjour, Frédéric. Thank you for very much for your speech. My question is, uh, you know, my interest is about the wetland. Um, is there, um, which is the role, if uh, it is uh, possible, in the discourse on uh, wetland in Hong Kong, but, but also around in the scenario of pandemia in the, in the, in the global discourse about it? Thank you very much. And I think we can collect another question, so by uh, Bonnie. Uh, hi, Frederick. So I have a question about not wetland, but wet market. Um, mm -hmm. So I, it's specifically about the first bullet point in the conclusion. So you talk about the uh, aviation reservoir has a role to unstigmatize Asian populations. So I was wondering if there's, what is the role of wet market um, in the pandemic besides being the site of spreading? Um, and then if there's an um, um, opportunity for like those bird watchers, basically like citizen scientists to work with mar uh, wet market workers. So like the wet market is not only like a victim of animal rights and um, just basically everybody now. Mm -hmm. So I think you can start to answer. Okay. Want. Thanks a lot. So I, I will try to take all these four questions together um, uh, uh, because basically what I try to do now is to apply these concepts that I build for bird flu in Hong Kong to bat coronavirus in Wuhan. And that's the, that's the source of the new project that I'm starting, uh, 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 trying to precisely follow the tracks of coronavirus from bats to maybe pangolin to humans in, in central China. Now, um, so what is the role of social sciences in studying such a controversial question as the role of bats and pangolins in markets in uh, central China? Of course, I'm, I'm not doing any prediction. I, I cannot say when the new bad virus will return. Uh, this is impossible. Virologists themselves cannot make prediction. They can only measure the, the genetic um, um, uh, similarities and um, uh, the, the genetic, what they call genetic distances between bad viruses and, and human viruses. Um, but what, so what I try to show uh, as, as I, answer to Mara in her first question is to shift from a, a, a linear view of, 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 of the chain of transmission to a more holistic view of all the relations involved in the uh, in control and regulation of these wet markets, which are now considered as the, as the point of origin of, of uh, a lot of infectious diseases and pandemics from, from China. So, uh, uh, I, I must notice that I, I've been inf very influenced by the work of uh, Anat Singh uh, in the last few years. And uh, I was very fortunate that she was one of the reviewers for my uh, book at Duke University Press. And when I, when I wrote my first book on flu, uh, uh, I didn't know how to really write it. So I wrote it as a kind of literary uh, narrative. But I were, what I really wanted to do was a kind of, of, of bird flu book, like she did her mushroom book, which is to, to, follow, to follow birds as they, as they fly with viruses all over the world and, and reveal different kinds of attachments and entanglements, disentanglements as they, as they go through different kinds of markets. And I think we can do the same, the same reasoning for bats. So we now know that, um, um, bats have become closer to human habitats in, in, in South China 
because of deforestation during the Maoist years. So in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, many, many trees were cut in the forest of Yunnan uh, to provide uh, uh, material for the Chinese industry. And there were also a lot of uh, villages that were invaded by uh, Chinese Red Guards. And so at the end of Maoism, there were all these forests that had been cut down and all these villages that, that were left empty or void uh, because it was the failure of the Cultural Revolution. And in the 1980s, 1990s, um, there, were, there were attempts to, to replant trees. And uh, Michael Hathaway, who has worked with uh, Anad Singh, has showed that. There was an, what is called environmental wings. There was a strong environmental movement. And one of the targets of these environmental movements in China was precisely the pangolin trade, uh, uh, showing that uh, uh, pangolins that were used for Chinese traditional medicine were now the object of uh, the global trade from Africa, and that there were even some pangolins that were uh, raised uh, in, in farms uh, to provide, uh, to, to, to supply for the immense uh, demand uh, of uh, uh, rich uh, Chinese uh, citizens. And so you can argue following Hanat Singh that uh, uh, bad coronavirus are not the revenge of nature, as some say. It is, it is something that emerges in the, in the ruins of Maoism and that spreads with, um, with, with the emergence of capitalism in China or with the acceleration of capitalism in China in the 1980s. Uh, and Wuhan is, of course, a major, a major point of coincidence between this emergence in, in uh, wild landscapes and this transmission through the chains of the industrial world. So that would be an answer to your questions on wetlands and wet markets. Uh, uh, the, the equivalent of wetland for uh, the, the, the Wuhan situation is this forest of Yunnan that we, we still don't know. Uh, and there are a lot of bat lovers and, uh, and natural Nature, nature protection is to really study very seriously all the uh, uh, changes in the behavior of bats in, the, in this area. Bats, being a, uh, bats are protected species um, and they, they, they live together in, 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 um, in caves. That's the reason why they have viruses that are so lethal, is that viruses constantly mutate to go from one species of bat to another. And because bats fly, they are the only mammals that fly. So they have developed an immune system that can uh, 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 receive viruses from other species and also uh, that can resist uh, the, 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 the cost, the, the metabolic cost of, uh, of flight. Uh, so for all these reasons, bats are very interesting as models of what could be uh, 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 humanity. In some ways, some, some have even argued that bats and bats like rats are in competition with humans in, in terms of the occupation of, of, the, of the planet because they are they can live together uh, in so different environments that they and, and with viruses that, that they, they are them are much better than us at, at globalization. That's the, that's the first point on, on wet, wet um, sorry wetland so the shift from wetland to to to, to the Union forest and, and all these areas are also protected by WWF so these are also global, uh, global sun. Now on wet markets, um, wet markets, it's a very interesting term because it's, it's a term that it, it was formed in Singapore in the 1970s when the, uh, when the government of Singapore, which is Chinese Confuci Confuci Confucian uh, um, uh, elite based, uh, uh, decided to clean all the markets in, in, in Singapore. And the, the, the notion of wet market refers to the fact that these markets uh, needed to be really clean at the end of the day with water. So they were wet, uh, not because they had dirty animals, but because they were clean every, every night. And so the idea of the, uh, uh, of the agriculture, uh, global agriculture organization, uh, whose head is a Chinese guy, the, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is based in Roma actually, is, is, uh, is directed by a, by a Chinese guy. I forgot his name, but um, he's a very renowned agronomist. Uh, so the, the, the idea of qualifying animal markets in China as wet markets is precisely to implement the measures of Singapore to 
central China and clean this area of dirtiness. So it's part also of a narrative of Chinese modernity. So the question now is how do you conflate this new narrative of protecting bats in, in Yunnan, in South China, and then cleaning the, 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 the wet markets in, in the big area, in the big cities of central China. So how do you, how do you conflate these two narratives in this new center? So that's, that's the thing that needed to be, and it's really a new holistic picture uh, that, that needs to be studied. Okay, so uh, we can continue with other question, Roberta, Raffetta. Oh, sorry, uh, Roberta, I can't hear you. Sì. Okay. Mi sentite? Sì, certo. Okay. So, uh, uh, bonjour, Frédéric, and thank you very much for your interesting talk. I have a curiosity. Uh, you have shown a picture um, uh, of uh, uh, scientists uh, making uh, phylogenetic trees. So, I wonder if uh, those scientists with whom you have collaborated have the same hunting uh, perspective as uh, microbiologists, of, or if they have other imaginaries because i have worked as well with uh, that kind of scientists and they have uh, interesting very interesting imaginaries but different ones from the hunters so the the scientists with whom i have worked they mostly are of italian and american origins so i would like to compare with your experience thank you thank you and francesca oh, sorry sorry Francesca Deklic. Thank you. Ciao. Hello. Uh, thank you. I mean, I uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And I also am very looking for, longing for reading this book because it, I also agree that, I mean, you bring the ontological turn to a point that it's more related to scientific knowledge paradigm and so that's um i think it's very interesting and uh, that's why my question is actually more about uh, something you have not had time to say <laughs> because of the time uh, because uh, to unpack a little more the strategy strategies of the animals that put in place in certain condition uh, that was at the end of your presentation i mean it's, it's, it's a small question i guess that in the book there is more about this and uh, but uh, yes, I, I think it's something to be taken, you know, cautiously an interesting issue. But I would like to know something more about that, if possible, if there is time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Enzo Allegro. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much to Mara and uh, to Luca for uh, this interesting uh, uh, meeting. And uh, very thanks to Frederick uh, for this uh, lesson. I read uh, from uh, Frederick Keck from a Purgatory to Sentinel in Cambridge Anthropology. And uh, very, very, very thanks for this contribution. Uh, I have a short question and I think a very stupid question. Uh, uh, definitely for you, from your point of view, no? this is a question between uh, uh, ontological discussion, philosophical and anthropological. Very stupid, I repeat. But from your point of view, virus is life or not life? Life, 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 okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, can I yeah. take these three questions? Or? Or, okay. or if I can add a question? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. So I give Luca. myself the floor. 
so okay. the wild imaginary and the microbiological science and the industrial techniques are three spheres through which you analyze the med cow issue when the animal flow were reintroduced in Europe in a fish feed in 2013. So uh, I was wondering if uh, this three sphere work uh, to explain the current pan pandemic and if so, how could we interpret this pandemic through uh, these three lens, the, uh, through these three spheres? So we, the three spheres are the prevention, precaution, preparedness? Yeah. Okay. And the uh, question uh, is uh, on transfer from Matco disease to bird flu. Yeah. Okay. It, okay. And uh, right. may I ask you to add another question? Uh, and I give the speech to Jane and Henrici. Henrici. I don't know how to, how to pronounce it. Sorry, Jane. That's all right. It's Jane Henrici. Henrici, sorry. No, not at all. Thank you very much. This was a really fascinating presentation. Um, so you mentioned earlier that one of the research questions that you posed is um, whether the level of training by Wuhan physicians to the simulation of a pandemic is sufficient, if I understood mm -hmm. your question uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. And so I have um, a few questions related to that. So one was simply, um, if, if that that was you said that the triage was to reduce emotionality and if it, well, i was trying to figure out whether the objective of that was to reduce the emotionality among the physicians or among the patients and then um you also mentioned that sars pandemic nurses are now viewed as heroes and you said that this was a depiction and i was trying to just wonder whether or not the depiction were um only of nurses who were female that was just one point but then also are they only of nurses who, who died um, in treating SARS? Because if so, then it, this, it seemed like you were also talking about notions of the sentinels and the bird soldiers as the translation from um, the Mandarin. So I was wondering if whether or not there was also a notion of sacrifice among those heroes. But, because then that then brings me to this, this point you're making about heroes who are hunting the virus. Mm -hmm. And you showed these scientists um, and the vets and the, the biologists, these different uh, mm -hmm. individuals and groups. And, and I was wondering if, if these current heroes overlap with these earlier heroes in some ways and whether or not these physicians who are then undergoing the, the preparation, the simulations, are also um, being viewed as heroes, at least with the COVID-19 experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that that um, that that keeps coming to mind is because of, of some of the depictions, some of the articles that are being presented out of China. For example, in the sixth in the sixth tone, um, with regards to what physicians themselves are saying or were saying in Wuhan, at least during the lockdown, it just it didn't sound well. It didn't sound like the the training, as you call it. Um, reach the level of the preparation that uh, that they would have liked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will I will uh, come back to the first question and um, go through the kind of ontological debate. So the, the argument I make coming back, can you see this slide here? Yes. The argument I make is that these are two groups of virologists and that they, 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 share, they share the same ontology of, uh, of, of virus hunters, but they implement it with different techniques. So <clears throat> these, these guys, so the way they, they frame the difference is between wet lab and dry lab. So these guys are doing the wet lab. They are collecting feces, and then they are desiccating the viruses, they isolate the viruses, sometimes they, they infect uh, living cells with the virus. All this is wet because it's basically alive. And these guys are doing the dry lab. So once the sequence is downloaded on GenBank, then they use a lot of softwares, and then they build these wonderful phylogenetic trees, 
and there's a competition between uh, between let's say 10 labs in the world that can build these trees for the the lab that will produce the most beautiful tree that's basically the way they, they frame it right because the most beautiful tree is the one that encompasses the most information in one striking image so my argument is that both of them are hunting, but with different techniques. These guys are hunting by taking the perspective of animals. As Guan Yi said, when I go to a Chinese farm, um, I imagine myself as a bird that is going to invade a Chinese city, right? And, I, and I, 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 I'm thinking of which way I should pass to successfully invade that city. And these guys, they're also hunting, but they are not thinking about animals. They're only following lines. So this is much closer to what Timingo calls following lines, right? They are, they, animals and humans are only are becoming figures on a tree. But if you cannot read this tree, you cannot know which one is the animal and which one is the human, because it's basically, it's lines. And what these people are doing when they're competing with each other to make the most beautiful tree, is basically competing between virus between herders who, who build who, who draw trees who, who build images of, of relations between at, at a very speculative level so that's why i say both of them are in that ontological uh, conception of hunters but at different levels now the 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 so that's why i so that i introduce ontological debate in science studies because we have now forgotten because the ontological turn has become so speculative that it comes from a very simple question that uh, Vivero de Castro has uh, raised in the 1990s about, it's, it's, it's actually a complicated question about the names that Amazonian societies give to humans and animals, it's about you know, cosmological deixis. Um, but it's, it's about the question of um, uh, what it means for a hunter in Amazonia to take the perspective of the animal, of the prey. Um, and, and, and then there's a debate between a lot of anthropologists. Um, Vivero tends to think that the, the shaman can take the perspective of the, of the prey because he basically sacrifices the prey and takes the, take the position of the prey in sacrifice because he, because he works with Tupi. Uh, uh, societies that practice sacrifice, and then there's people like this scholar who work on more uh, um, uh, that in societies that don't practice sacrifice, and and who practice war all the time, and so they take the perspective on on of animals because they consider animals that they consider their prey as uh, step stepbrothers, uh, be because they are used when they do war to take the perspective of the stepbrother that they're going to kill. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a debate within uh, Amazonian anthropology on, on what it means to take the perspective of the prey, and the whole debate is about sacrifice precisely. Uh, is it is it sacrifice that helps you take the perspective of the prey, or is it war? If we can summarize, yeah? and and that's why the scholar uh, uh, brings animism. You take the, you, you 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 see the interiority of your enemy. And, and Vivero uh, uh, uses perspectivism and multinaturalism, which is the idea that you can really see yourself from the point of view of the animal you prey on. And so I take this discussion uh, to the field of virus hunters, because basically what I argue is that virus hunters refrain from sacrifice. Some, some of them do. Some of them advise governments to do sacrifice, to kill millions of chickens. But most of them, because they're basically nature lovers, that's why they make alliance with bird watchers. And so they like, they like following lines. They like imagining that they are birds or, or that they are bats. Um, this leads me to the question of is virus live? So for me, and for the virologists I've, I've uh, observed, a virus is not live. Well, you know, it's a very complicated ontological question uh, because it's virus is an information that seeks to replicate, but because it doesn't have the, the means to replicate by itself, it's not life. Life begins with bacteria. But from an anthropological perspective, when I study relations between virus hunters and birds, 
I do not consider viruses as life. I consider viruses as signs in the sense that Eduardo Cohn gives to science in his uh, complicated semiotics, uh, Persian semiotics, uh, uh, which is to say that, that, that uh, virologists regulate their relation with birds in a disrupted ecosystem or environment through drawing images of viruses. So that's why these lines are so important. Uh, so for me, they're signs. They're not, and so I don't want to engage too much in this kind of viral politics that a lot of philosophers are taking, which are very interesting. If you are Deleuzean, for example, which is to say we, we're going to see the COVID pandemic from the perspective of viruses themselves. As an anthropologist, I cannot see the pandemic from the perspective of viruses just because I've not worked enough with viruses. Some of the virologists I, wor I worked with think they are viruses, but they're very scarce. Most of them think they are more like bats or like, or like birds. Uh, this leads me to mad cow disease. So the main difference between mad cow disease and, uh, and, and bird flu is that um, it's more difficult to imagine yourself as a bird than imagine yourself as a, as a cow. Just because in Europe, we've lived with cows for centuries. Um, and, and we, are, we have become much more distant from birds. Uh, and my, what I found interesting, so that's why it was so difficult in Europe to kill millions of cows to protect ourselves from mad cow disease at the time of precisely the implementation of the precursory principle. Whereas it was much easier for Europeans to kill millions of birds because they were not so attached to birds. And what I found striking, it was, it was much more difficult for Asian societies to kill millions of birds than to kill millions of cows. Well, they didn't have to kill millions of cows because they didn't have mad cow disease, except in a few cases in South Korea, but, which was imported from the US actually. But uh, when they killed all these chickens and, and, and ducks and geese and quails, they were very sad. They, they, and they, that's why they prayed with the Buddhists for the, the salt of the birds. And so that's, that's why I think virologists actually express a view of animals which is not specific to virologists, but which is deeply inscribed in human um, societies and which is more developed in certain societies than others. In Europe, we have become closer to cows and dogs and cats. In China, for a series of reasons, they are, they are closer to pigs and birds and chickens. Uh, and then to finally come to your question on triage, so the, the, the answer is that triage allows uh, the, the, the hospital staff to control their emotions, not the, not the patients, because the patients uh, are played by uh, uh, voluntaries. It's, it's actually people who, who do a lot, a lot of exercises for fire, you know, uh, uh, car crash, plane crash, so they used to play the victims, but they, 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 they are not the real victims. Whereas in simulations, hospital staff play their own role. So because they, they, they learn to treat potential victims who are actors, they learn to control their emotions when they have to do these decisions on who am I going to treat. And that's why, um, so it's a way to uh, control the emotion of doing this difficult, decisions of who am I going to, to treat in, 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 term, in time of uh, scarce resources, which is the ethical problem of, of triage. But it's also a, pro, a, a way to deal with their own fear of dying from the disease, because from what I read, none of the scenarios of simulations of pandemic involve the time when a, a, a hospital staff becomes sick with the, with the disease, none. That's very interesting. Um, so the, 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 the idea of the sacrifice of the hospital staff treating patients is not included in the scenario. Okay, thank you. We have uh, one last question. Uh, so Francesco Zanotelli. Francesco.
Francesco Zanotelli? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for uh, all of you and especially to Fred for the exciting presentation. <laughs> I only would ask um, if you can add something about uh, um, the political side of the question um, and especially taking the idea of um, the idea of the field, the political field. I would like to know uh, what do you think uh, about uh, how uh, this um, uh, the, the field of uh, coronavirus is, is uh, structuring uh, between uh, <clears throat> among uh, um, especially uh, inside the WHO uh, because if it is true what you said uh, about this I, I understand a sort of uh, um, opposite uh, uh, positions uh, of the biologist, one, the Asian, maybe we can say the Asian biologist or Chinese biologist, more uh, in, the, in the line of coexistence, and uh, um, Western biologist, uh, more in the line of uh, prevention or barriers. And so uh, you said also that uh, in, in the last decades, uh, WHO uh, hosts a lot of uh, uh, these Chinese biologists, so it maybe it means that uh, a, a, a more uh, coexistence group, a <laughs> uh, bi uh, bi uh, biology group, uh, uh, have uh, populated the uh, WHO. Uh, I, I don't know if it is in this sense, but I would like to know something more about this uh, relationship between inside the WHO. Uh, maybe there is a sort of uh, uh, of uh, quick uh, of uh, um, fighting in, inside this, and if if the coexistent um, thinking is uh, taking place in this last last, uh, last years, and what do you think uh, if this uh, kind of uh, uh, different um, way of thinking can uh, populate also the the minds of uh, the politicians? Okay, thanks. It's a, it's a complicated question. I try to, to answer shortly. Is that the last question? Yes? Yes, it is. Okay, so I take like four, four minutes to, to reply. So WHO is, is highly scrutinized and criticized today because of its role in the, in the delay in taking seriously the pandemic because uh, the head of WHO, Dr. Tedros, um, has been very lenient to, 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 to Xi Jinping in, in the first months of the, of the pandemic. And he even declared the pandemic too late. So you must remember that uh, WHO is, a, is a, an international organization that is uh, funded by member states. And that, that the role of WHO in 1945 was basically to reconstruct the world after the Second World War so the U.S. were the, mem the major member, the major funding member, and um, because the world was basically under U.S. and, and, and U.S. Uh, well, WHO was under U.S. Uh, domination, and the Soviet Union played a minor role, in my view, in WHO at the beginning. And then the, the main success of WHO was uh, the eradication of smallpox by uh, basically U.S. Um, U.S. Uh, 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 um, physicians who applied to um, smallpox all over the world the methods of vaccination that had been successful for polio in the in the U.S. And that's in the 1970s, and then uh, so the, it was in some way the implementation at the at the global level of the idea of prevention uh, through vaccination that was uh, implemented in the U.S. with polio. Now, this, this success of prevention through eradication of smallpox was contradicted in the 19, um, at the end of the 1970s by the emergence of Ebola uh, and then AIDS uh, from Africa. Uh, and then there was the uh, awareness that uh, you cannot eradicate diseases by infectious diseases by 
vaccination campaign. Um, smallpox is the only disease that can be eradicated at the global level for humans because it's the only disease that cannot be transmitted from animals to humans. All other diseases come back to humans. All other infectious diseases come back to humans from animals. So that's what, that was the time of the awareness of the uh, vulnerability of the human species to infectious diseases coming from animals. And that's the time when the idea that it was necessary to prepare for a flu pandemic coming from birds in South China was very high at the agenda of the WHO. End of 1990s, who added with the fear of bioterrorism. And then there was the SARS crisis. And the SARS crisis was the opportunity for the WHO to, to, to have its second, uh, its second success, if you want. The two, success, the two main success in the history of the WHO is the eradication of smallpox in the 19, beginning of 1970s and SARS in 2003. In between, it's, it, it, it's a long story of compromissions with pharmaceutical industries and, and, and asking member states to fund the WHO. And we are now again in the time of crisis of the WHO. Because the, so the agenda of, of, of pushing China to, to, to reveal its cases on uh, SARS was, was supported by, a, 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 I think she was from Norway, Gram Arlo Bertland. She was, she was the head of WHO and she was very strong in having WHO uh, acting as an independent agency at the global level, finding alliance with scientists all over the world. And then this was compromised by the election of Margaret Chan, who was supported by the Beijing government, and then by the election of Dr. Tedros, who was supported by the Beijing government, because Beijing has interest in Ethiopia, basically. And, uh, and, and that's also the moment when the US were basically stopping funding the WHO, but it has started like 20 years ago. So the question you ask is whether Western scientists have a different view of anticipation of pandemics than Asian scientists? My answer is no. I don't make a culturalist uh, uh, stance, right? I don't, I don't mean that all Chinese have in their brain preparedness and that all Westerners have in their brain prevention and that when they meet with each other, they cannot talk to each other. That would be, that would be a very bad culturalist uh, stance because it doesn't work like that way. My, my stance is that virologists, when they, when they practice virology, they, when they follow mutations of, of viruses in the relations, in the changing relations between humans and animals, are thinking like animals. They are taking the perspective of animals through, through viruses. And they do preparedness as virus hunters prepare for uh, uh, bad encounters uh, uh, with animals or, or revenge from animals. So, whether you are Chinese or Australian or European or American, when you do virology seriously today, you are virus hunters, you think through animism. Or, uh, and, you, and you implement preparedness as a kind of a synergetic technique. Now, the argument is that uh, uh, Asian populations are more ready to understand what virologists are doing because precisely they have not had this history of prevention that we have had in the West. Whereas we expect the state to act as a good pastoral agent, because as Michel Foucault has shown, biopolitics comes from, the pastoral, uh, from pastoral practices. And we have forgotten synergetic techniques because we think that, uh, that having a state that protects us from the dangers of the wild is better, uh, uh, is, what, is what modernity is about. So that's why um, uh, we, we are less ready to understand what biologists, all biologists, be they Chinese or, or French or Italian or, or American, tell us about uh, the, the ecological meaning of pandemic. And that's why the, the debate is not between China and the West. The, the debate is between virologists who have a real take on what's going on in the world and then um, uh, uh, civil society who tries to understand what they, they're saying and, and anthropologists in my view are, need to, to expand what they're saying, to, to translate what they're saying and then, and then the national states and then WHO. And that's why we cannot criticize WHO or national state without criticizing ourselves for not understanding what these critical actors are doing.
Thank you, Frederic. Uh, I think it's time to, to close the meeting. It was uh, really uh, interesting to follow the debate. And uh, I know that there, are, uh, there were lots of people coming and uh, joining us during the meeting. I think it's uh, the good uh, side of uh, this digital uh, room meetings uh, that, that everybody can come staying at home. But in, in case of a real face-to-face uh, -face meeting, uh, now it would be time to go to take a beer or a, a glass of red wine and continue to chat uh, for all the evening. And we will uh, postpone this uh, opportunity okay. for, for after, after the, the... I, I will the take a, a beer with wishes for uh, Italian uh, recovery and, and French-Italian yeah. French... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we will uh, wait another time and I, I really thanks again all of you, all the pa participants and you, Federic, and uh, we will have another uh, uh, appointment for our Speakers Corner uh, on, the, on May 12th with Andrew Lekov and I think uh, we will uh, spread the, the information around and uh, thanks to everybody, thanks again. Goodbye.